Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing the remarkable life and achievements of Israel's sixth Prime Minister, Menachem Begin. Warm well, welcome to the programme and uh, today's uh, special guest comes all the way from Cambridgeshire. He's a good friend of mine. His name's Martin Cohen. He's been on the Middle East Report uh, a few times, so it's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, back on the programme. But I, I know that uh, I like to call you uh, Motti as you like to be called, so for the programme I'll call you Motti. Great to see you, Motti. Well, thank you once again for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to meet you personally. I mean, I look upon you as a very dear friend as well. Um, and it's very nice of you to invite me on to exchange views and hopefully some of it might benefit um, the viewers. Well, well, of course it will. <laughs> we're, we're discussing yep. a, a, a hero of yours and um, that is the remarkable life and achievements of Israel's sixth Prime Minister, uh, Menachem Begin. Uh, um, controversial um, in terms of kind of British history. Um, but in terms of what he's done for the Jewish people, uh, absolutely remarkable. And of course, he brokered the famous peace treaty uh, between Israel and Egypt in 79, which still holds today. So we also know that he did a, an amazing job in helping to rescue um, the Ethiopian Jews to help them make Aliyah. Uh, and that was one of his top priorities for his government. But also, we have to thank him for taking out uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, nuclear reactor as uh, Saddam Hussein was developing nuclear weapons. And had Israel not done that in 1981, uh, the, the West would have faced a whole different Saddam Hussein uh, in the Gulf War 10 years later in 91. So there is so much we can discuss about the remarkable man who is Menachem Begin. But what is it about Menachem Begin that just intrigues you and interests you so much? For me personally, I call him a Jew's Jew. He, as you say, he's very controversial and the, the, the British authorities, they absolutely detested him, hated him with a passion. Um, it wasn't just that, but he, he was, he'd lost his family in the concentration camps. So because he lost his family in the concentration camps. He's naturally one of those Jews. They either become very quiet and just want to lead a quiet life, or you become a fighter. And he became a fighter. And he, he's really, he, he's never been put on the same pedestal as David Ben-Gurion, which I believe is a pity. Both men were in their own way, they were great, great men. Um, Menachem Begin wasn't so much the diplomat, but his real diplomacy came through when, as you've mentioned before, he signed the peace treaty with Sadat, which is something the Labour Party, as they were then, were never able to do. No matter whatever they promised, nothing happened. Yep. So, yeah. Actually, it's the same thing with Herzl. Herzlia is named after Herzl, but a very another famous Jew is called Max Nordell, and they work together. And you see street signs with his name, but that's all. <laughs> Strange. No, 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 extraordinary. So <laughs> if, we, if we go back to uh, the life of Menachem Begin, he, he was born on the 16th of, of August, uh, 1913 in Belarus. And as a young child growing up, his family had to flee the uh, First World War because of the uh, war between Russia and uh, Germany. And then at a very young age, he joined the Zionist youth movement known as uh, Betar, that was founded by its president, uh, Zev Jabotinsky. How much do you think his life growing up um, under that uh, conflict of the First World War uh, really kind of shaped his kind of Zionist ideals because even from a young early age um, he was uh, he was a passionate Zionist. He realized at that age that 
no matter how much one wants and desires peace, sometimes you have to fight for it. And that is probably the answer, because unless you fight for your peace, you'll just be run over. And, and that's the life I've chosen. I'd, I want peace at any cost, but not all costs. Um, and unfortunately, I, I've had to fight my way through life as well. Not as bad as Menachem Begin or the people in the camps or those who are in the Ukraine at the moment, but I've had to fight all the way through, including employment, latter years, everything. Yeah, I, I think life's a fight anyway, so <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think you've got any choice in that. But I mean, if you want to know more about Monty's life, look back on one of the previous episodes where Marty shares his life growing up in the East End of London and facing a lot of Jew hatred because he was uh, Jewish in the post-war years. Uh, Marty also, I mean, the biggest influence, I've got to say, on, uh, uh, on Menachem Begin, on his life, his ideology as well, was uh, Ziv uh, Jabotinsky, um, who wrote uh, about the Iron Fist when it comes to Israel, that uh, Israel, if they're going to live in the Middle East and survive in the Middle East as a Jewish state, then, then or is it also the Iron Wall as well, that Israel ne needs to be tough against the Arab neighbours and that the Jewish people need to stand up and defend themselves was a kind of focal point of uh, Jabotinsky's ideology. But can you share with us the, the influence that Jabotinsky's had, not only on Menachem Begin, but, but also on the entire Likud party uh, uh, and that movement? Yeah, and of course you had Trumpledore as well, who was very famous. It, again, the, he's had to fight. We, the Jews had to fight to gain their state. And he's realised that after watching betrayal after betrayal after betrayal, um, the world watched massacres long before the Second World War and really nothing was happening to help them. And during the Second World War, there was nothing much to help them. So that, that would have had a, a dramatic effect on him, that living under those conditions, there's no doubt about it. And also when he was um, 31, uh, he uh, studied law at uh, the uh, University of Warsaw in Poland. <coughs> and then in 1936, uh, went on to serve as the head of Betar in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and then in 39, was, uh, was appointed to be the head of uh, Betar in Poland with 100,000 members under, under his command in which they helped to prepare uh, Jewish people to make illegal alia to uh, the British Mandate of Palestine. Um, but I think when you, when you look at his life, he would have been in Czechoslovakia with the rise of Nazism, uh, would have seen the, uh, the Nazi coup that took place and the Nazi trick to take control of the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia. Uh, he would have seen the coup that overthrew the uh, government of Czechoslovakia in which Hitler annexed um, uh, Czechoslovakia and also Austria as well. He would have also seen in Poland as well, uh, kind of the build up to the First World War as well. Um, and what do, you, what do you think his, how his ideas kind of shaped his ideology, knowing that he was growing up in Eastern Europe at this time of the rise of the Nazi party, the rise of Nazism, fascism, which at his very core was, was anti-Semitic as this was the focal point of the Nazi ideology and of course which led horrifically to the final solution and the killing um, of mass murder of over six million Jews in the Holocaust. It, it really had a, a huge effect. Um, I, I'm sure the Evian conference helped to fashion form people's convictions that nobody wanted the Jews. Simple as that. And the writing was on the wall anyway, because in Germany there were signs up, Juden verboten, Jews forbidden. Uh, the swastika was going up everywhere. The Jews were being thrown out of work. They weren't allowed to do this. They weren't allowed to farm, not to run a business. They could only shop for food at certain hours. Uh, there was no life there at all. And uh, I know in Austria, when they had the uh, Anschluss there, uh, there was a mass suicide going on with the Jews throwing themselves out the windows rather than go to the camps because they, they already knew what was going to happen. 
And of course, also at that time as well, I mean, you've got, <coughs> you've got European Jewish communities there that were of the thinking because they went through the programs of the late 1880s and, yeah. and, and around the turn of the century around 1901, 1902, felt that they could survive this new wave of uh, Jew hatred and, and that they would be okay not thinking uh, <coughs> the worst uh, uh, of what happened. Now, uh, clearly from Menachem Begin's character, he wasn't one of those uh, Jewish people who thought like that. And, and clearly his whole um, philosophy was to train as many uh, Jewish fighters as he could in Poland to prepare for resistance, but also to help get Jewish people out of uh, Central and Eastern Europe to go to Israel. Um, and I think when you see what he saw as a kind of visionary that he was, um, you know, he, he, he saw the writing on the wall, didn't he, with the, uh, the rise of Nazism and the danger it spelt for the Jewish communities right across Europe. Yeah. Um you mentioned the 18, late 1800s. I mean, you had the Cossacks around, the, uh, around Ukraine, Belarus and so on, and they were just slaughtering Jews quite openly, quite openly. Um, and then that led on again throughout the time. There's, there's been this Jew hate, but it's been sometimes below the surface. But by the time Hitler came to power, it was very much on the surface. It wasn't just uh, losing jobs and uh, uh, losing your money. There were the, even when you left, you were, you were allowed to leave with nothing, just, I think, a minimum amount of money. And then that was taken by the, by the customs, the German customs. Um, so he, he was a fighter. Um, he realised that unless you fight, you won't get the peace. And that seems to have been taken up by uh, the previous president, Trump. Strength, uh, peace through strength. Yeah, Netanyahu's been saying this, and that was really the, uh, the ideology of the Herod party, um, which I became a member of. Because I, I realized they're just trying to walk away and they come up to catch you and then they start a fight and you think, do I carry on walking? No, I've got to fight back because it will never end. So, and that would have been, that would have been the story, because when you see Menachem Begin, he, he was a man unlike the majority of people in Israel, because it, most of them, of course, were really the secular, religious, uh, non-religious, the kibbutz, that sort of thing. Um, so that was different, whereas he felt he was a Jew. Uh, whether people were religious or otherwise, and that was the foremost uh, <coughs> thought in his mind, is to help save Jewish people, which he did. Yeah, and of course he would have felt that incredible pain when <coughs> both his parents and his brothers were murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust as well. Yeah. <coughs> Probably would have reinforced his viewpoint that he had to fight the Nazis at all cost. And, <coughs> and, is that, uh, and, and of course then he was also then, I think in 1940, uh, he was actually then arrested by uh, Stalin, um, sent to one of those horrendous labour camps known as uh, the, the Goulash, um, uh, until 1943 when he was able then to uh, make friend with a Polish person and join the, uh, the Polish resistance army um, to actually take part and, and fight back against the Nazis. And, and for him, obviously fate would determine that he would go to the British Mandate of Palestine to be trained then. So as a, a Jewish Zionist, uh, <coughs> to actually get Alia on behalf of the British government and, and also on part of the uh, Polish resistance where they were trained, um, must have been an absolute delight for him. I, I think he realised then, um, with the British betrayal, that it wasn't going to end. And it was just very unfortunate he chose to go to war with Britain because Britain had basically achieved everything in trying to stop Israel from becoming a Jewish state. Yeah. And, and he had to fight it. And there were other people like him. The, the, the socialists wanted to do it very peacefully, which really didn't get them anywhere at all. And he saw what was going on around the world yeah. with different riots and that sort of thing. And, and he took it upon himself to fight however he could. 
Um, and, and he would rather do it diplomatically rather than to be warlike. But like I said before, sometimes in order to achieve peace, you've, you've got to fight to defend yourself. I mean, he took a very um, different ideological stance to the leader of the Jewish Agency and then the leader of Haganah, Israel's first prime minister, Ben Gurion, uh, David Ben Gurion, who yeah. uh, has that famous quote, if I can actually uh, pronounce it correctly. Uh, I think he said, we will fight um, <coughs> the, uh, the Germans as if there's no mandate and we will fight the mandate as if there were no war. Um, and, and, and so therefore, I mean, the contribution made by the uh, Jews of the British Mandate of Palestine uh, during the Second World War uh, was exceptional. And I don't think it's fully appreciated the role played by the, uh, by the Haganah and Jewish fighters uh, during the Second World War with the British. And of course, uh, Israel's uh, famous general, uh, Moshe Dayan, uh, lost his eye fighting against the Vichy uh, French government up in Syria. And we also know that um, so many Jews of Palestine went on suicide missions to fight against Rommel's forces um, in the deserts of North Africa. And, and uh, you could say that they were part of the elite SAS and played a major role in hampering Rommel's advances across North Africa and had uh, Rommel actually succeeded, uh, this would have been another holocaust for the Jewish people under the British Mandate of Palestine. And we also see then that he opposed uh, the British Mandate and the British control over, over Palestine. But why do you think he then decided after the Second World War um, to turn to violence and uh, setting up the, uh, the Jewish underground militia group called the Ingrun um, to fight against the British and uh, to fight against the British mandate. He realised that, the, the, as I said, the, the British will continue their betrayal. They were actively siding with the Arabs, that the Arabs were rioting and the Jews had to pay the price. They weren't allowed to defend themselves, but in the end, they, they had to try and do something, including the Haganah. So in, in doing that, he just felt that whatever needs to be done will be done. I mentioned here previously about the King David Hotel. It was, it, the hotel wasn't blown up, it was a military wing which was blown up. And he ph there were people who phoned, um, or one particular person I know who phoned, and I met her, Geula Cohen, and she was a Cherutnik. And I met her when she visited Cherut here in London. And she, she said she had phoned the military high command in Jerusalem to tell them that there is a, a bomb which will be going off. Please leave with it as quickly as you can. It would be time to go off in about 15, I don't remember now how long, 15, 20 minutes, whatever. Um, she phoned the French consulate in Jerusalem and told them, advised them what was happening to get their people out. And she also phoned the Palestine, the Palestine Post, which was the forerunner of the Jerusalem Post, the English language newspaper. And unfortunately, the head of the British military um, was renowned for his hate and um, he, he refused to accept it and his, his whole attitude was the Jews don't tell us what to do, we tell them. Amazing. So let's have a look now at uh, the life of Menachem Begin, mm -hmm. who was Israel's uh, sixth uh, Prime Minister. And uh, this is thanks to the wonderful museum in Israel uh, called the Begin Center. And if you haven't uh, visited the Begin Center in Jerusalem, it's a definitely must see one of Israel's best and finest museums. Menachem Begin, the sixth Prime Minister of Israel, the commander of the pre-state Irgun, the man who established and led the parliamentary opposition for 29 years, defending a vibrant liberal democracy, who led a national liberal revolution in Israel, including policies of social justice and a free market, who acted to safeguard Israel, destroying Iraq's nuclear reactor, the man who signed the first peace treaty between Israel and an Arab state, changing the Middle East forever.
The Menachem Begin Heritage Center is a state institution with responsibility for preserving the legacy of Menachem Begin, a leader of principle and rare integrity. Here are five facts about the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. One, the center houses an interactive multimedia museum that reviews Menachem Begin's life and educates about the values he believed in. Two, the center is home to a comprehensive archive comprising documents and historical records covering every chapter of Menachem Begin's extraordinary life. Three, the center's education department provides services to a diverse target audience in Israeli society and around the world. Four, the center offers a variety of cultural and intellectual lectures and events that take place on a weekly basis and deal with the fields of the Jewish people, Zionism, Jewish thought, Israeli society, and regional affairs. The lectures are also broadcast online and are watched by tens of thousands of viewers throughout the world. Five, the center hosts historical and educational tours of its unique surroundings and stunning views, which overlook the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, as if bridging the gap between past and present. We invite you to be a partner in our goal of continuing the legacy of Menachem Begin, his values and ideals, his love for the Jewish people and the land of Israel, and his commitment to the principles of liberty, democracy, social justice, and equality. His story is our journey. And uh, that's courtesy of uh, the uh, Begin Center in uh, Jerusalem. So definitely, definitely worth a visit and uh, thank them for allowing us to show uh, what uh, their museum is like that is dedicated to the life and legacy of Menachem Begin. Now, now one thing about um, Begin which, which is extraordinary, so <coughs> on the one hand he was part of the, the Ingram, um, which was uh, a fight, uh, underground militia fighting force that fought against the Arabs who were um, essentially very, very concerned about the prospect of uh, the re-establishment of a state of Israel. Um, and we know historically going back that uh, Israel had good relations with the, uh, uh, with um, one of the, uh, Al uh, sorry, uh, Mugman, is it Hussein, sorry, Hussein, um, who was the Arab leader in Saudi Arabia and then the Arab leader in, um, in Jordan um, before he, he left for Iraq. And during that time, the Zionists and himself negotiated. He supported the establishment of a Jewish state in the Middle East because he felt that that would then lead to a Middle East state, uh, an Arab state in the Middle East, and that they would be free from uh, British and French control. Um, so you have to put that in context. And of course, then the British appointed the Grand Muftah of Jerusalem, um, Amij al Husseini, um, to the position of Grand Mufti, who was uh, a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, influenced by uh, Baldana, the Egyptian um, scholar and Islamic thinker. And of course, then what we see there is nothing but conflict, hatred, massacres against the Jewish people, particularly as we look at the Hebron massacre of, 20, of 1929, uh, combined with the fact that he even met with, uh, with Hitler and joined his own, create his own Muslim SS division of the uh, of the Nazi uh, SS and had his own kind of regiment there so we know that he was one really antagonizing uh, the Arab people to fight and resist uh, the Jewish presence in the in the British mandate of uh, Palestine of course that's the context of this and then of course we see that the Arabs then started to attack uh, the Jewish people and the residents there in a horrendous way the British were involved in between but the British uh, had decided, even going back to the mid-1920s, that they had no uh, desire to honour the Balfour Declaration or the San Remo Agreement to help uh, establish a Jewish state. They wanted to control Palestine for themselves as it was a strategic waterway uh, between the, uh, the west of Europe, the Middle East and, of course, Asia and, of course, the highly strategic Suez Canal 
was what they wanted to take control of. So we, we can see the backdrop of that. Uh, and of course, with uh, six million Jewish people dying in the Holocaust, with Menachem Begin's own family being murdered by the Nazis and the British are not doing anything to help the Jewish people. And of course, if we look back to the, the white paper of 39, that probably prevented anything between one and 1.5 million Jewish people fleeing Nazi persecution who could have been given access into uh, the British Mandate of Palestine, which would have saved that many people. And then, of course, at the end of the war with the, um, uh, the government of uh, Attlee and, of course, uh, Bevan, Bevan, prevented the Jewish Holocaust survivors from making Aliyah to Israel. So when you see these circumstances, you can begin to see uh, why Menachem Begin thought it was essential to take up arms against the British in order to force Israel's independence. That's why I said a bit earlier that Britain was virtually at war with the Jews, with, with Israel. Um, she's never been a friend of Israel, never. And uh, he, he would have seen so much going on with this betrayal continually, because after all, um, Churchill himself gave away 78% of Palestine to a trans, called trans, Transjordan, uh, to a, a cousin of the king of Iraq who was set up by the British. He was jealous from the same sort of tribe, Bedouin, and he was um, then made the king of Transjordan. And really what was left over was the rump, and that was then confirmed this was going to be for the Jews. Yeah, everything east of the River Jordan. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, sorry, west of the River Jordan. West of east the River of Jordan. Jordan was, was, uh, was Including Gaza, originally. But what happened really was that even after the Second World War, the, the, uh, there were a number of certificates which would have allowed the remaining percentage of Jews to go to Israel from Europe, and Britain denied them that as well. They were never ever used, never. So when, when there was no compassion for these people who could have escaped into Palestine under the British mandate, leaving the, the, uh, the camps, then there, there was no choice but to fight back. Yeah. And of course then, after, the, uh, after Israel achieved uh, independence on the 14th of May 1948, uh, Menachem Begin disbanded the, the Ingram um, and then became a, a politician and was uh, leader of uh, the opposition in Israel and the Knesset to uh, David Ben-Gurion's uh, Labour Party from 1948 all the way until he came to power as Prime Minister in 77. But I suppose we have to... Um, unpack um, his really uh, in the 1950s making a stand against uh, of, uh, the state of Israel receiving war reparations uh, from the German government. Why do you think he took such strong opposition to uh, German uh, uh, war reparations for the Holocaust and its treatment of the Jewish people during the Second World War? I would imagine simply because the, the people who were leading Germany who were still involved in industry, commerce, government, the establishment, they were all Nazis. Or having been through, I'm sure, denazification, they were now back to being human beings again. But they clearly weren't. And, and uh, the hatred was still there. They, they, were st they were still dealing very openly with the Arabs. Um, and let's not forget, of course, many of these German scientists didn't just go to Russia and Britain or captured, were taken to Russia or they were fated in North America with their big cigars and, and big cars and dining out on champagne and everything. The people who had experience with missiles and um, high technology, they, the British used them as well, treated them very, very nicely. So how does a Jew from a concentration camp feel when he sees people like that leading the life of Riley and meanwhile they're, they're being denied any sort of privileges whatsoever? And, and let's not forget, the, the British actually transferred uh, the, the uh, survivors who managed to get to Israel, 
back to Germany and, the, and guess who were guarding them? Germans in uniform. Yeah, Hamburg and that whole story is detailed in the, uh, the Exodus ship story. Yeah. Uh, Leon yeah. Lewis's book, The Exodus. Um, and I interviewed some of the survivors from there. Um, and it's, it's absolutely horrific, the treatment of the British government towards the Jewish people, particularly after the Second World War as well. But one thing we have to mention, I think, uh, Motti, re re regarding that, is with new evidence coming to light, in the, as you said, in the 1950s, that the German government was, uh, of West Germany was supposed to be a new democratic nation um, and uh, just destroying all the links that it previously had with the Nazi party and, and with the Nazis. And then suddenly in the 1950s, there's a, a reintroduction of, uh, of Nazis, of, of SS officers, of leading officers uh, in, in Hitler's regime to high positions within the German government, within the judiciary, within the government itself. Um, and I think looking back on history, um, knowing that only 1% of the uh, Nazis and the collaborators who were involved in committing the most vile crimes in human history against the Jewish people during the Second World War never faced justice. Uh, anything between 750,000 and a million people were involved in carrying out uh, the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, only 600 have actually been prosecuted. So looking back in history now, but he also saw why David Ben-Gurion said, look, this is a new West Germany. Uh, we need to have good diplomatic relations with this new uh, German government with economic ties. We need as much money as that we can get because we need to build up our um, arms manufacturers so that we can defend ourselves in any future wars um, against the Arabs uh, after Israel's war of independence in 48. But looking back on history, I do think that Menachem Begin <coughs> was right in, in protesting against the German uh, renunciation of uh, finances to, to finance uh, and trying to make war reparations for that vile, uh, vile atrocities that occurred during the Second World War. I think the problem is that the money that was given to many of the survivors in Israel and possibly in Europe, I'm not sure, but certainly in Israel, <clears throat> the money that was given to them had to be spent either in Germany or on German products. And I know when I was in France I, I, uh, and Germany, when there was in, in Germany there was a, a cafe which was frequented by the American military. And a, a, a Jewish uh, soldier I was, got friendly with, we went there and uh, to this restaurant, bar, and uh, she was from Poland, her husband was from Poland, I think. And I just looked at them and I thought, how on earth could they be living here in Germany? I, I mean, I've gone there to work because unfortunately the, the contract we had, I was supposed to go to France, but I ended up going to Germany for fi over five months before I could get into France. So the, the, the problem was that she told me she had to come back to Germany to gain the money um, and or buy German equipment. The, and whatever they paid Israel, it doesn't match anywhere near what was stolen let, financially, let alone the cost of human life. Absolutely. And that's a very important point to, to mark as well. But also we, we see that uh, Menachem Begin's first experience of, uh, of, of government was during the crisis of 1967 and the Six Day War when he was brought into the government uh, of national unity, uh, led then by Israeli Prime Minister Evi Leshko. <coughs> um, how much do you think having that governmental experience and being in government for the first time helped to prepare Menachem Begin to actually win the 1977 general election in Israel, which, which saw him become uh, pro Israel's sixth Prime Minister? I get, well, when I was here, uh, uh, I can't remember if it was the second time I was here when you invited me, but I happened to mention that d during the Six Day War um, there was no help at all, none whatsoever. Um, every promise was broken because the Straits of Tehran were, were blockaded by the Arabs. Um, Nasser's army came up to the, almost to the gates of Tel Aviv. They were only a few miles south of there, from Gaza. Uh, Utant 
or UFAD uh, from the UN, received the demand to get, to get out of uh, Egypt, and he just took it up. And, and, that was, and that was against the agreement they had between Israel and Egypt. So you just couldn't trust the people. Yeah. And, and again, when he could see that nobody was prepared to really help, America gave promises, the British gave promises, there'll be a fleet there uh, to safeguard the passage of, of uh, merchant ships and that sort of thing. It was pie in the sky, it was just a dream. It, it was um, a false promise, as was evidenced by what happened at the end. Yeah. And if we look at, uh, for example, uh, Menachem Begin's uh, premiership, I mean, uh, the, his list of achievements are quite incredible. I mean, uh, he had a real heart for uh, the plight of the Ethiopian Jews. And of course, uh, was made famous by um, Operation Moses with the incredible airlift and so uh, the, the Mossad, uh, together with the support of the Israeli government and Prime Minister's office, um, helped so many Ethiopian Jews to actually walk from Ethiopia uh, into Sudan, and Sudan was an enemy of the State of Israel, and then secretly um, having that incredible story of the, uh, the Red Sea diving resort uh, was used as a cover to rescue the Ethiopian Jews, and then they'd be picked up by um, the Israeli uh, kind of navy off the beaches and then taken to Israel and of course then were later airlifted. And um, that's one of his incredible achievements, recognizing that this, he was helping to fulfill Bible prophecy in bringing the uh, Jews of Ethiopia home. Uh, of course, he's also incredibly famous that uh, he's the first Israeli prime minister ever to make peace with an Arab state. And of course we had the uh, 1979 um, um, <coughs> Camp David Accords, signed between the then Egyptian president Anwar Sadat and himself and of course that historical peace treaty um, but before then also the fact that he hosted um, Anwar Sadat in the Knesset in 77 uh, when he came to power and that Sadat uh, addressed the Knesset and his desire for peace um, isn't that just an incredible story but also an incredible achievement I in history very much so. I do believe that it was also downplayed quite a lot, unfortunately. Um, but it was a real, real achievement. It, it, took, it took a Prime Minister from Kherut to obtain a peace with a cold peace, but still peace, um, with its biggest enemy, Egypt. That by far they had the, the most equipment. Um, and of course, true to Soviet Russia, um, all the equipment was pre replaced very, very quickly. So she was still a threat, um, but the, the peace has held all this time. And I'm pleased to say that because of Menachem Begin's original peace with Anwar Sadat, uh, the peace these days between the two countries is actually strengthening because of the problems now from Iran. No, absolutely. And the terrorism threat as well. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent video produced by the Israeli Foreign Ministry um, that looks at five, uh, sorry, ten facts about the Israel-Egyptian peace agreement of 1979. Forty years has passed since al-Sadat visited Jerusalem and since the signing of the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. But what did this peace bring with it? And what difference does it make? Here are ten facts about what happened since then. The end of belligerency between Egypt and Israel has paved the way for the allocation of economic and human resources to many other positive fields in both countries. The peace treaty has resulted in the settlement of the boundary issue between both countries. Egypt has also regained its sovereignty over the Sinai Peninsula. Many tourists from around the globe, including tens of thousands of Israeli tourists, head for Egyptian tourist destinations. The Suez Canal has been reopened to maritime traffic while the minefields in Hurghada have been cleared, rendering it a tourist destination. Similarly, Egypt has regained its control over the oil fields in Abu Redis and Sinai. The peace treaty has strengthened the alliance between Egypt and the U.S. Indeed, Egypt has become one of the major allies to the U.S. 
Egypt has played a pivotal role in peace talks between the Palestinians and Israelis and has hosted summit meetings between Palestinian and Israeli leaders to advance the peace process. The QIZ agreement between Egypt and Israel has promoted Egyptian exports to the U.S. with a value exceeding $8 billion. This has also created hundreds of thousands of employment opportunities. There's significant cooperation in agriculture that has resulted in the establishment of plantations in Egypt. Thousands of Egyptians come to take complementary courses in Israel on agriculture. The peace treaty has also resulted in the opening of borders for imports between both countries. Egypt exports many goods to Israel, particularly food and raw materials, while Israel exports agricultural machinery and fertilizers. Egyptian culture is well respected in Israel, and both countries are keen on strengthening their relationship. Collaboration between both countries is strong in political, military, and economic fields. وأقول وأوجه نداء للشعب الإسرائيلي وأقول لدينا في مصر تجربة رائعة وعظيمة في السلام معكم منذ أكثر من 40 سنة. Peace has brought with it great benefits that contribute to stability and prosperity for the whole region. And that was courtesy of uh, the Israeli Foreign Ministry. So thank you for letting us show that video. But also it just highlights um, the incredible impact that Menachem Begin made with signing of the Camp David peace accords between Egypt and Israel um, that was uh, sponsored uh, by uh, US President uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, uh, Motti, I think we have to kind of move on as well, because one of the other major achievements of Menachem Begin was his brave and courageous decision in uh, 1981 to take out the Iraqi uh, nuclear reactor uh, called Osrink. And uh, in the early 80s, Saddam Hussein uh, was determined to uh, develop nuclear weapons. And of course, Israel faced international condemnation for doing so. Uh, and, but the skill of the Israeli Air Force pilots was, was quite incredible. But only that, even President Ronald Reagan criticised Israel publicly for doing that. And then 10 years later, of course, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. We have the Gulf War 1991 and the American, British and coalition forces didn't have to face a, a, a nuclear Saddam. So, you know, again, incredible foresight to realise that, uh, that he cannot allow any other nation to have the possibility of, t of destroying Israel and another Holocaust again. So we can see his hindsight and we can see his bravery and courage uh, in his decision-making process. He, he just spoke common sense. He, he was never, in my view, personally, a, a real diplomat. He was very much a, people of the, a person of the people. And that's what I really loved about that, that man. He didn't take nonsense from anybody. M may I just add one thing on that yeah, to give a clue absolutely. as to what sort of person he was and how undiplomatic sometimes people can be. In, uh, on the uh, 22nd of June, 1982, um, the then Senator from Delaware, Joe Biden, visited Israel on behalf of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee and met up with Menachem Begin. Uh, who was Prime Minister, and he turned round to him and said, um, you cannot continue with these settlements. You have to stop it. Um, e every settlement has to, has to go. You can't build any more, not in Jerusalem, not anywhere. Um, otherwise, we will cut aid. And um, unfortunately, he, uh, Begin, he chose the wrong man to say that to. And his response was... Um, don't threaten us with cutting off your aid. It will not work. I'm not a Jew with trembling knees. I'm a proud Jew with 3,700 years of civilised history. Nobody came to our aid when we were dying in the gas chambers and ovens. Nobody came when we were striving to create our country. We paid for it. We bought for it and we died for it. We will stand by our principles. 
we will defend them and when necessary we shall die for them again with or without your aid. Upon hearing that apparently, from what I understand, Biden thumped the desk with his fist. And if one has seen pictures of him, or at least um, uh, during the news when he's been questioned by newsman now his president in America, and he's been asked difficult questions primarily about his son Hunter, um, he, you see the rage in him, and he's, he's really annoyed and angry, having a go at the reporters. And um, <coughs> after he'd finished banging his fist on the desk, uh, Prime Minister Begin retorted, this desk is for writing, not for fists. <laughs> Don't threaten us with your slashing aid. Um, do you think that because the US lends us money, it is entitled to impose on us what we must do? We are grateful for the assistance we have received, but we are not to be threatened. I am a proud Jew. 3,000 years of culture are behind me, and you will not frighten me with these threats. Take note, we do not want a single soldier of yours to die for us. I, I, it might be going off the subject a little bit, but when we look at Biden, who seems to be completely out of touch, um, I would have thought if, if a diplomat goes abroad to meet other dignitaries, surely they, they would want to learn a little bit about them. I'm quite sure he was warned by the State Department, which is like our own foreign office, uh, what sort of person Menachem Begin was. And yet he chose to deliberately try and pummel him down, and he really chose the wrong man. Now, if it might have been Prime Minister Lapid, he'd have probably doubled up and, and bowed down. Um, but that was the sort of man he, he, uh, he was. No, well, he was, uh, you know, no man's fool. And certainly his whole interest was defending the modern state of Israel and yeah. the Jewish people. I mean, we, we saw so that uh, not only was he a warrior, uh, prime Minister, but he was also uh, a peacemaking Prime Minister yes. um, with making peace with Egypt. Now, of course, <clears throat> when it comes to 1982, and his legacy is very much tarnished because of the Lebanon War in 82, um, I think he went in with m motivations. And of course, when we're discussing this, we have to put everything in its historical context. Mm. Uh, back in 1970, the PLO led by Yasser Arafat tried to overthrow King Hussein of Jordan. Um, and it was only the threat of Israel coming to the defense of King Hussein of Jordan because the British couldn't get there. They ignored that warning. The Americans said, we're too far away. Your only hope is uh, for Israel to get involved. So Israel uh, scrambled their military jets to take on something like 60,000 tanks and troops that were making their way down from, from Syria um, into uh, Jordan to overthrow uh, the King Hussein of uh, Jordan at that time. And because of Israel's threat of getting involved, actually push back um, the Syrian advance and uh, <coughs> King Hussein together with his uh, Bedouin soldiers were able to kick the PLO out of Jordan and of course they found refuge in Lebanon and of course Lebanon in the 60s and 70s was known as the Switzerland of the Middle East very much of a, a Christian Arab country in the region and with the PLO <laughs> now in southern Lebanon this changed the ethnic balance of power in the region, the PLO under Yasser Arafat used uh, southern Lebanon as a means of firing rockets and missiles into Israel, of uh, penetrating into Israel and committing horrendous massacres against school children and terrorist activities. And I think Begin finally said, <coughs> enough's enough, I have to protect my citizens. So he forced the Israeli, uh, ordered the IDF then to move into southern Lebanon to wipe out the PLO. But he also was working with the um, uh, Christian phalangists in, in, in Lebanon to uh, build uh, and strengthen uh, a Christian Arab nation in Lebanon to make peace with Lebanon. And of course, what happened then, the Israelis then got bogged down and the Syrians got involved, the Iranians got involved. We had the formation of Hezbollah formed in that war and the Israel faced a horrific war of attrition. Um, what are your thoughts on the way that the way that this war went and didn't go according to plan was one of the main reasons why, uh, despite being re-elected 
um, in uh, 1981. Why resign from office in August of 1983? I think, uh, I understand originally they, they were supposed to go just a certain point, up perhaps the Litani River, and then they came to Beirut itself. And I, I'm not sure why they would have done that, but the point is that at that time, um, the, the, uh, the United Nations force there just allowed the, the PLO to do whatever they liked. They had, even now, they have no control over the PLO. Or Hezbollah, I'm sure, involved there as well. Um, and um, it was just incredible. It was a real pity because what they should have done, in my view, and I'm not a military analyst by any means, that they cleared it out. If the United Nations would have taken firm action, they could have said, that's it, no more terrorists down there. I was stationed up there in my reserve oh, duty. Okay. Um, and Okay, I won't go into that. But anyway, they, 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 uh, there were problems there all the time. And of course, what he did manage to achieve his military objectives was to remove Arafat and the PLO from southern Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, but that created a vacuum when we saw that was filled by Iran and Syria. And we saw the formation of Hezbollah, uh, the Islamic uh, uh, terrorist organization that has now in the region of 160 to 80,000 rockets uh, fired at Israel. He set up this uh, southern security zone in southern Lebanon um, to ensure that Israel held that territory to protect the citizens of Israel. And of course, we had the disastrous withdrawal of southern Lebanon by uh, Khud Barak in 2000 that gave uh, that moved Hezbollah right onto Israel's border. And of course, then we saw the uh, Second Lebanon War of 86. I went down to the last uh, uh, few minutes of, of the program, mm -hmm. and, and the, really this program has been about Israel's sixth Prime Minister, Menachem Begin. Um, Motti, what would you say that was Menachem and Begin's legacy, and what can other Israeli prime ministers learn from his time in office? I believe to learn from his, his ideas that a Jew has to fight for peace. There can only be peace through strength, um, th that land is supposed to be ours, and we've been betrayed time and time again. And let's not forget that Israel was going to be a state for the Jewish people, a homeland for the Jews. And when you're mentioning the Lebanon, uh, maybe it's good for your viewers to know as well that as Israel was going to be a Jewish state, the French were supposed to make the uh, Lebanon a Christian state, and they were in the majority. But sadly, as in most of the Muslim countries, they're now a minority, and by the way, there are thousands of those Maronite Christians now from Lebanon living in northern Israel. Of course, because uh, when we saw the collapse of the Leban Lebanese army in uh, Israel, so we yeah. disastrous were jaws of southern Lebanon. Uh, and what does um, Menachem Begin <coughs> mean, mean to you in the, the closing minutes of the program, Motti? Sorry, what, what, what does Menachem Begin mean to you in the closing minutes of the program? A man to look up to. I believe he was wrongly treated and, and looked upon as a troublemaker when he was fighting for his life. And, and like he said, we paid for it, we fought for it, and we'll die for it if necessary. And um, also, what's also interesting as well, that Menachem Begum was not buried uh, with the likes of Itzhak Rabin, David ben Gurion, other presidents at Mount Herzl, but instead was, was buried on, on the Mount of Olives. Uh, which is incredible. Um, <coughs> That's Menachem Begin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Motti, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on, on, the, on the programme and it's been an absolute delight to discuss the life and achievements of Menachem Begin with you. Thank you. And thank you as well, Simon. Pleasure. Yeah. And I want to thank you for watching uh, this programme at home. It's definitely worth researching into the life of Israel's sixth Prime Minister, known as Menachem Begin. Um, Growing up in Eastern Europe with the rise of Nazism, um, fa fa facing the fact that his uh, parents and his brother were murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust, and then to become Israel's Prime Minister in 77 and making peace with Egypt, as well as helping the Jews of uh, Ethiopia make Aliyah and protecting Israel from a nuclear Saddam Hussein. His achievements are incredible. So I want to thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.